I usually get a consequence. Someone would like think that you would be like a like an evil person or an evil kid, but you should never be like an evil kid. Uh, you could say in your head, I'm not supposed to do that. I will not do that. Um, try not to think about it. Um, so, um, use like, Stoppertron and breathe yeah, ten times. Yeah, and then you, like, cool off. Just freeze. Freeze? Mm -hmm. Just stand there? So there's today's sermon. When there's enticements and temptation around you, just freeze. Just stand there. Um, good, good wisdom, but there might be more to think about and talk about. We're talking about longings, the deepest longings of our hearts. And some of the longings we've talked about are ones that when, when you bring up the concept, people's minds kind of, kind of unite around what you're talking about. You know, we a longing for love. We have a kind of a sense of what it means. I want to be loved and I want to love well. A longing for joy. It's kind of a sense of what that means. A longing for kindness. I want to be kind to others. I want them to be kind to me. A longing for faithfulness. But there's a sense of uh, when we have the conversation, we can kind of be on a similar page. But the one we're going to talk about today, self-control, is very unique. Because we can be talking about the same situation and, and the same need and the same desire for self-control and be having two totally different conversations. I want you to imagine two people are talking together and they're saying, they're, they're friends and they're Christians, they're talking about, man, I, I just, one of them says, I'm just grappling with self-control in my work life. And the other one says, me too. So what do you mean? Well, let's talk about it. So they have this, this great conversation about, about wanting to have self-control in their work life. So the first one just kind of discloses their challenge. And they say, you know, I have a hard time getting up in the morning to get to work. I'm always running late and I need to have self-control to get to bed earlier so I can get up and get to work. I have a, I have a hard time keeping self-control at my desk, just staying focused on my work. My mind wanders. I start surfing YouTube. And I just, I, got, I don't, I have a hard time staying focused on my work. And I just, I need self-control just to get a whole week of work in. I need self-control. And they say to the other person, so what's your challenge? And they go, well, it's the same, but it's totally different. <laughs> I need self-control around work, but I can't stop working. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't stop thinking about work. I work seven days a week, and when I'm not working, my brain is in work mode, and I can't stop checking emails and texts. Even on my day off, I'm always working. Two different people grappling with self-control around the same topic, but very differently. And both need self-control. Both, so both want to partner with the Holy Spirit to have self-control in that area of their life. Two other people are having a conversation, and they get talking about self-control, about their finances, about their money. And one of them says, yeah, I, need, I need the Holy Spirit. I need to partner with the Holy Spirit to have self-control with my money because I can't stop buying stuff. I mean, I, I stay up late at night and I watch his infomercials and I think that's ridiculous, but by the time the commercial's done, I, I order it. And two days later, it shows up. And I already have four of those. And I, can't st and I need the self-control as I partner with the Spirit to, to control my spending. The other person says, well, I, I need self-control with my money, but it's totally different. I don't spend anything. I am so tight that when I walk, I squeak. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I don't give to God. I don't give to people. I don't even give to my own family. I'm just like, I'm a hoarder. And I just can't. So two different people, same topic, same fruit of the spirit, totally different conversations. What's the point? For every one of us, in a, in a subtle, nuanced, personal way, there is an area or areas that we really need more self-control. And we know it, and God knows it. And so I want to invite you this morning, as, as we think about this, if you look in your bulletin, you're going to find this the sheet that says, Longings, the path to self-control. This is for you to use now during the sermon or later today. And right under where it says the path to self-control, I'm going to encourage you to write down, listen closely, one area. You, you, you're like, well, I have 14. That's fine. Pick one. Otherwise, you're going to be exhausted and discouraged. Just pick one area. And, and I want to even, a moment we're going to pray and say, God, what's my one area right now that you want to really partner with me by your Holy Spirit and grow this fruit of self-control in my life? And, and if you're thinking, man, I, I need, I'm not sure what the area is. Let me give you a moment to reflect and let me give you a little help. Maybe there's some ideas that, that might help you. So here's some images that might help you think about an area you need self-control. Maybe you're a foodie. 
Maybe you love nice, good, fancy food, and you like you know, delicacies, and you just, it's, it consumes your time and your mind, and you're, and you're, you're eating, and it's just, a, and maybe that's, you're, you're, it's, it's, but we're all different. So maybe your challenge is food, but maybe it looks more like this. Uh, you're driving around late at night. It's 12.45 at night, and you're heading home. You're going to be in bed by 1.15. You already had dinner, and yet... There's the arrow pointing, and when the arrow points, you need to follow the arrow, you know? It's a sign from Jesus. And so you know, you're like, okay, and you go, that's, you know, maybe that's my, I, that God, I need self-control. It's hard for me to say no. Uh, maybe for you, it's, it's an emotional anger thing. Maybe there's moments where things get tough, and you just, that. Um, you just, and you don't even see it coming. It's just like, it's there, and then, it's out there. When you're driving, when you're at work, when you're alone, it just it kind of wells up. You say, God, give me self-control when it comes to my anger. Maybe it's temptation. Maybe it's sexual temptation. At your school, in your neighborhood. And then, okay, let's move to the next one. Some of you, uh, but but may, maybe that's your area. Maybe, maybe it's substances. Maybe it's drugs, alcohol, where it's like you go, I don't want to. I know I shouldn't. But I just, I'll start tomorrow. I'll start next week. And there's always that one more time. And I keep falling back into that the pattern. You say, God, I need your self-control. Maybe it's social media. Maybe you kind of can't go very long without just checking, how am I doing? Who am I? Do people like me? What's, you know, and, and, and there's a sense of that connectedness, and you go, it's not, not a bad thing, but I'm so connected. I need to have control to kind of release my heart from being controlled by all of that stuff. Maybe it's just, just viewing, consuming media, which has become so much a part of our culture. Maybe it's just, you got the picture there? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, just, it's just, you know, for hours and hours and hours just consuming, watching, 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 and going, man, I'm spending my life staring at a screen instead of living life. God, give me the self-control to be able to, to hit the off switch, to walk away, to disconnect from that. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe you're, it's a world of gaming. Maybe for you, you're like, man, it's just, I, I, I can't stop until I pass out. Um, I can't stop till it's the next day or hours in the next day. And, 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 but I don't want, I want to enjoy it, but I don't want to have it consume me, but I need self-control. I don't know what the area is. It could be your words. It could be gossip and not being able to control your words. It could be being dishonest and <laughs> lying. I don't know what it is for you. Here's what I want you to know. I know what it is for me. I know there's some areas of my life where I have incredible self-control. And there's areas in my life where it's just a battle and has been in some cases for decades. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, th this is, I, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, oh, come on. Um, <laughs> it's, th this is the reality that we face. And, and so we're going to think today about this idea of, of, of self-control. And I want to just pause right now and pray. And I, let, let's just quiet our hearts. And Lord Jesus, would you speak to each one of us right now? Some people have numerous areas running through their mind. Would you help their mind just settle on the one area you really want them to tackle right now in their life? Some need just to say, Lord, what's that area for me that you know God and I know I need self-control? Just take a moment with the Lord. Spirit of God, we pray for your power in us and our partnership with you to see this fruit of self-control grow in our lives. And we pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that today we won't just learn to tackle one area, but we'll learn a process, a way of thinking that could help us in many, many areas as we continue to become who you want us to be and battle to, to resist temptation and grow the fruit of self-control in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. If you have your phone or your tablet and you, you have a Bible app, open to Galatians chapter 5. And this won't be on the screen, but I want to give you kind of an overview. The passage we've been looking at, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, lists these nine fruits of the Spirit, these things that grow in us as we partner with the Spirit of God and God does His part, we do our part, and we grow that fruit of the Spirit. And we've been looking at different ones from this passage, but the context of this chapter is very important because it begins with these words. In chapter 5, Galatians 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Please hear this. God wants to set you free. He wants you to walk in freedom. And partnering with the Spirit of God and growing in self-control is one of the ways that God grows you in freedom. Look down at verse 13 of Galatians 5. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. 
but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Free to follow God, not free to do whatever we want. So this is God's desire for us, is freedom. And then in verse 16 of Galatians 5, we read this. Paul writes, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He says, walk by the Spirit, and the power of the Spirit, grow self-control, and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Do you understand that what comes naturally to us is often not good for us? Does everybody understand that? This idea that if it comes naturally, I should do it? Man, our world would be utter chaos. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this idea that if it comes naturally, I have to, I should, I must, I'm compelled. Most of what I tend to want to do naturally will kill me or someone else. I mean, think about it. The Christian journey is taking the things that might come naturally. Some things come naturally that honor God, praise the Lord. A lot of things come naturally, they don't honor God. Then the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit fills us to where we exercise self-control and we don't act in anger that comes naturally or we don't act in desires that come naturally. We control the natural desires that don't honor God with the supernatural power of the Spirit. Someone say amen. amen. That's the journey that we're on as followers of Jesus Christ. And, and so we're gonna talk together about what that looks like and, and, and this sheet is kind of a, just a tool that you can use later today or even right now to begin writing down some thoughts that'll prepare you to walk in, in self-control in a very specific area, whatever God puts on your heart. So, we're talking about growing the fruit of the self-control in your bulletin. There's an outline with a place that kind of hits these main thoughts as well. If you'd like to fill in the blanks, this will be very gratifying for you. You can fill in some blanks. So here's the first one. Growing the fruit of self-control, start with me. Face it, I make lots of bad choices. Self-control is about controlling ourselves. Probably our biggest challenge in life is not controlling other people, it's controlling ourselves. And, and this passage in Jeremiah 17, 9 says this. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You ever seen that on a plaque in someone's kitchen in their house? No, we get the Lord is my shepherd gets a plaque. For God so loved the world gets a plaque. This one just stays right there in Jeremiah 17, 9, Right? But listen to what it says. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? We have to acknowledge that we can self-deceive. We can lie to ourselves. We can lie to others. And this is beyond cure. This is going to be a battle for all of our lives. When, when you get self-control in one area, wonderful. But say, God, is there another area? And God will always say, okay, here's the next area to grow in. This is a journey, a lifestyle of growing in spiritual maturity by growing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And here's where we have to be honest about our hearts and our lives. Much of what we do that's sinful is enjoyable and pleasurable. If it weren't, we'd probably stop doing it. We don't want to acknowledge that. But oftentimes, this, the thing, you know, when someone gossips, the book of Proverbs says, gossip goes down to the, to the soul like choice morsels. Oh, it's delicious. It's sinful, it's wrong. But it's really fun. We have self-control over those things. You know, eat, eating in an out burger at, you know, at 12.30 at night right before you go to bed may be delicious. It's just not good for it. I mean, it's, 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 most of those things are pleasurable. And we have to be honest about our own hearts. My, my little brother Jason, when he became a Christian, he became a Christian quite a while after me. When he became a Christian, he came to me kind of baffled. He'd been a Christian for a few months. And he said, yeah, Kevin, I'm having these weird conversations with these Christians I'm getting to know. They're talking about my life before I was a Christian, which wasn't that long ago for him. And they're saying, oh, wasn't your life just horrible before you were a Christian? All that wicked living in sin. Wasn't your life just horrible? And he's like, I keep saying to him, no, it was really fun. <laughs> I mean, he, he's just like, he's like, that's not the way I saw it. You know, I really, he says, he says but here's the thing. I don't want to live that way anymore. And I'm going to learn to not live that way. But don't make me try to say that was terrible because I enjoyed a lot of it. Let's be honest, Right? Temptation, sin is enticing for us because in many ways it's pleasurable and enjoyable, but we choose to not live in that in the power of the Spirit. Growing the fruit of self-control. Identify the enemy and acknowledge that there is a spiritual battle. We have to say there is a battle going on and there is an enemy of my soul. Listen to these words from 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith 
because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. You are not alone. This battle is a battle we all face. So, so we have to acknowledge that there's a battle going on and we're going to resist. If you're a note taker, write this down. There's three primary ways this battle goes on. There's three kind of sources of this battle. Here they are. Me, my own sinful desires, the world, world systems that are not honoring to God, and the enemy, Satan. Me, the world, and Satan. Now don't try to break all those down and figure out, okay, well this temptation, where is it coming from? Because it all kind of merges together. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're dealing with something in your own heart that, that isn't honoring to God, don't say, oh, that must just be me. The enemy loves to piggyback on any bad desire we have and go put, kind, of, kind of push us down. So, so we're kind of standing at the edge of the cliff with our own desires, and then the world says, oh, it's fine, and the enemy just kind of goes, hey, push, pushes you over. I mean, it's, it's, don't try to break that down. Just acknowledge that there's a real battle going on. And, and here's the thing. We oftentimes want to just, you know, we just, okay, well, we can blame it on, on, on Satan. But it's partly our desires, it's partly the world. When I was a kid, there was a comedian Uh, by the name of Flip Wilson. Now, I'm dating myself when I say that, but Flip Wilson was hilarious. If you're younger and you haven't heard of Flip Wilson, you could probably go on YouTube, put in Flip Wilson comedy, and you'll get some of his comedy. But one of his big bits was the kind of thing where he talked about all the different things that happened in his life, and he would kind of finish with this statement, the devil made me do it. You know, the devil made me do it. That was kind of, he'd always blame the devil. But here's the thing. The devil's just given the final shove. Our hearts are already inclined towards sin, and our world's inviting us toward it. So what we have to do is say, there, there, there's a battle going on, and I'm going to stand strong, and I'm going to fight back. And then, growing the fruit of self-control. Acknowledge that this is a war that I did not volunteer to be in. I never said, hey, sign me up. I'm going to enlist for this battle. I didn't sign up. You didn't sign up. But guess what? If you're a follower of Jesus, you're in this battle. So acknowledge it. If you, if you act like it doesn't exist, well, I just don't believe it exists, then you lose. You don't acknowledge the presence of the enemy or the battle, you're going to lose. So say, I didn't sign up for this, but there's a real battle going on. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 12 says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. You've got to stand. You've got to be strong. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We need to say, I am in a battle, and the enemy is real. And that enemy is this combination of my own desires, of a world that says, go for it, and of an enemy that says, I want your utter destruction, so I'll push you towards anything that harms you and harms your future and harms your family and harms your joy. So the enemy will keep pushing, but the enemy is partnering with our own desires and with the world systems. So how do we grow the fruit of self-control? Recognize the tactics because they're custom made. Recognize the tactics because they are custom made for me. The the enemy uses custom made tactics just for you out of your family system, your personal history, your kind of desires and tendencies, your leanings. The enemy takes anything where you're leaning the wrong way and kind of customizes the pathway and says, hey, check this out. So so we have to start to acknowledge that there are tactics and say, and here's where I can't explain what the tactics are against you because I don't know what your area you need self-control is and I don't know what your family is like, how you grew up, what your tendencies are like. So, but, but I know the enemy customizes tactics so there's a place actually to write down on the sheet some of the tactics the enemy uses against you. you, you my, my biggest battle, one that I've, I've been battling for over three decades now, my biggest battle is this and this is where I need the greatest self-control. It's care for my body. That's, that's one, that, I should say it's one of my biggest battles. At different times, it's the top one. And sometimes it falls to place two or three. There's lots. I, I deal with different battles. But one is caring for my body. Getting good sleep, exercising well, and eating the right things. I didn't sign up for that one, but that's a battle. And it's been going on for a long, long time. But, but it's custom made. Because here's the reality. In my family, with my dad, my mom, and five kids, it's a, been a battle for every single one of us. So there's things in my own upbringing that kind of feed into that. It's different than your experience, but my, that's my experience. So I got to say, okay, that's part of what's happened in my life. That's part of my, my passionate personality. When I love something, I love it a lot. And so, I mean, so I've got to say, what are the tactics? What are the ruts that, that the enemy tries to get me into? Because once you're in a rut, man, it's hard to get that car out of the rut. It's hard to get your life out of the rut. So the enemy uses certain tactics against me and against you. So we've got to look and say, you know, what, what are the specific tactics the enemy is using against me? 
When does he attack? How does he attack? When do I tend to fall into this sin? Man, it tends to be late at night. It tends to be when I'm alone. It tends to be when I'm really tired. It tends to be when I'm not spending time with Jesus. But look and say, what are, the, what are the things that make up who you are and the way the enemy tries to drive you away from the things of God and toward the things that, that bring damage to your life and to your future? John chapter 10, verse 10 says this. It says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. It's Jesus speaking, and he says this. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, overflowing, abundant life. That's the desire of Jesus. And some people think that Satan, when he attacks, it's like, well, he attacks Christians, but he's on the side of non-Christians. Wrong. Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy everyone and everything. And Jesus wants to bring life and life to the full. So, so acknowledge, say, here's the tactics the enemy is using Here's how Jesus wants to strengthen me, and I want to be a partner with the Holy Spirit in growing this fruit of self-control. So how, how do I start to practically, how do I think and change my thinking and living in a way that will help me grow in self-control? Here's the next thing. Growing the fruit of self-control. Name the costs and be specific. There is something very, very wise about looking at the area that you're walking into, the, the attitude, the words, the actions, the lack of action, whatever it is, when you know you need self-control, to look at it precisely and say, where will I end up if I keep going down the road I'm going down? And write it down where you're gonna see it. If I keep siphoning and funneling off money in the workplace, it's called stealing or embezzling, but if I keep taking money, when I get caught, I will, probably, I will end up losing my job. I will end up losing financial security. I may end up in jail. I mean, some of them you wanna write down, some of you just wanna write down in your mind. Uh, not leave that laying around, but uh, <laughs> at your office, you know. Um, but, but write them down. If, if I continue caring for my, my body the way I'm caring for my body, here's some of the consequences. If I keep using my mouth the way I'm using my mouth, if I keep having explosive anger, here's how it's going to affect my children, my grandchildren, my marriage, my friendships. And you write out the consequences. There's something powerful about recognizing where we could be going, sending ourselves if we stay on that path. There's something motivational about that. As I was talking with one of our staff members about this message and about this topic, uh, she shared with me, she said, man, I, I wonder if my mom had known what her choices were going to lead to if she could have changed, if she could have had more self-control. She started sharing her family story. And I said to her, will you write that down and let me share it with the congregation? And she did. And so I want to share with you, this is one of our Shoreline staff members wrote me this note just this last week as we were talking about this. She says this, Kevin, as I mentioned to you this morning, my mom passed away at age 40. Her death certificate says natural causes because they were not able to find a specific cause of death. It was important to me to find a reason for her death and I went on a mission to speak to many doctors as I looked for answers. What I did know about her health was this. She was overweight, smoked cigarettes, had high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. She was always going through spurts of renewed health kicks, like starting an exercise or eating program in an effort for better health. I always wondered that if she had known that death would be the consequence of her poor choices, if she would have been able to stick to some of her health goals and had better self-control to reach her goals, what would have happened? I was 18, my sister was 14, when we said goodbye to our mom. I think about her often and wish she had the opportunity to know my husband. I wish that she would have been able to be a grandmother to my daughters. And she signed the letter. She says, I wonder if my mom had really thought through. She'd written down, I may never meet my grandchildren. I may, you know, these are the consequences. Would that have helped. That's not the only part, but I think part of wisdom says to look and be honest about where our choices could take us, and if we don't exercise self-control, what might happen? In Galatians 6, 7 to 8, we read this. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. A woman reaps what she sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will, weep, will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. There's benefit to thinking through what can happen if we keep behaving in a certain way. Growing the fruit of self-control. Here's the next thought. 
Identify the path forward. God's will and my longing. What are my steps forward? What will I do next? I have a problem with anger and I can't keep my mouth shut. What are my goals? How will I respond when I feel that welling up? How am I going to, you know, and just be specific. I don't know your area. I can't be specific for you. But I know that if you think about your area and pray about it, say, Spirit of God, what are specific actions I need to take? You can make a list of things. And you need to be specific and detailed. And say, here's what I need to press forward. It was interesting for me over the last, I, the, I, generally my messages for Shirley are done and finished six to eight weeks before I preach them. I give them to our team to work on visuals and dramas and, and, I mean, and, and the, the videos and all that. So um, I've been thinking about this for a couple of months. And part of me was like, okay, I'm going to talk about self-control. What's my, and I w- walked through this process. Well, what's my biggest area I need self-control? I really need to deal with my health. So for like a month, I'm like, okay, I'm going to work on it. And I set goals, and I, follow, and I don't follow through, and I, I struggle. And I keep, okay, well, how do I ramp it up? I finally came, just about a week ago, came to this thought, okay, I have to get support from other people. So I actually, I actually asked two friends of mine who are all both doctors, if I can send them every day for the 28 days of February, if I could send them what my sleeping plan my exercise plan, and my eating plan. And then the next day, I'll send them how I did in every one of my goals and what my goal is for that day. I, 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 I thought I need that level of being specific, writing it down, and having someone ask me how I'm doing and speaking into my life. So by the way, what I don't want is 150 different theories from all of you of what I should do, okay? <laughs> I love you. No thanks. I have two doctors that are going to be speaking into my life. What I do want from you is prayer for the next 28 days, okay? Pray that God will give me strength in self-control and I will be praying for you for whatever you put on the top of your page, whatever your area is in your life. But, but making decisions. If, and, and so each, each person, each situation is different. If you're consumed by media, if you're a binge, binge watcher, now when the term binge watching came out, it was sort of like a weird term, never heard of before. Now it's like, it's like this wonderful positive thing. Let's get together and binge watch. And, and it's like, oh, oh listen, I just, I just watched all seven seasons of this show for the fourth time. So it's like, oh, I've only, I've only watched all seven seasons of that show twice. I'm going to get moving to catch up with you. And uh, it's like, you know, and if you say, man, I, but I'm sitting, and when I, when I, Turn something on, my computer or whatever, and, and I, okay, when the show's done, here's the next one, here's the next one. And, I, and I, I'll start watching at 8 o'clock, and it's 1 in the morning, and I'm like, I can't stop. You say, okay, then maybe for you it's like, okay, by 9.30 at night, my media goes off. Television, phone, iPad, computer, whatever, all off. Yeah, that, that's torture, that's painful. Yeah, yeah, battling, battling this stuff is not easy. But specific, you, know, you have to say, what's specific for me? What will help me grow forward? In my, if, if, if you're dealing with enticement in the workplace with this person who is, when you're around them, you find your heart beating for them, but you're married to someone else, I reroute my walk. My plan is I don't walk by their desk or their office anymore. Well, it's further to go around this way. That's right, it's further, but that's the way I'm going. Why? Because that's what I need to do. You need to identify, here's the steps I need to take and what I need to do. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to all people, to all mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God is ready to show you a way, but you have to partner with him and press forward. Growing the fruit of self-control. Here's the next thing. Name the glorious results of self-control in hope. Say, here's what could happen in my relationships if I could get a hold of anger and not be explosive the way I am. Here's how I could be active, more physically active, if I was more healthy. Here, here's how I can utilize my resources if I didn't squander them all on things that don't matter. I mean, and Leah, here's, here's what God could do in me and make a list of all these amazing things that you could say, in hope, I long for these things. In Psalm chapter one, beginning, the very beginning of the psalm, it says this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Whatever your area of temptation is, wherever you need to overcome with self-control, whatever it is, I will guarantee you there's a bunch of Bible verses that if you committed one or two to memory, it would give you power. So how do I find those verses? Google. Uh, (laughs) Just do a search and say Bible passages about dealing with a temptation of sexual lures in the office place and it'll list them for you. And find your favorite one and commit it to memory. Bible passages about caring for my body. Bible passages about anger. Bible passages about gossip. 
You're going to find a list of 25 to 100 of every one of them. Look at the top five or 10, pick your favorite one, put it, you know, put it in your phone or put it on, on a card in your purse or in your wallet and go over it till you've meditated on it. And, got it in your, and every time that thing comes up, keep coming back to God's word and coming back to God's word. And then the passage says in Psalm 1, verse 3, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Put that vision in front of you of what can be. Of what, uh, you know, if I stop spending like I spend, how could I live my life differently? If I stop gossiping, if I control my anger, how would it change my life? Growing the fruit of self-control. Next, get the help you need. And there are many sources, but get the help you need. And, and you need help, I need help. When we're stuck, when you say, well, I, I'm going to tackle this area, but I've tackled it 127 times or 527 times, and I'm back here again. Be willing to start again, but in many cases say, I'm not going to travel this road alone. Do you know we have a whole ministry at Shoreline called the Lake Counseling Team? We have a whole team of people that Pastor Dennis and a team of great leaders have trained and equipped. How many hours of training do they go through, Dennis, to get... 45 hours of training. They're not licensed therapists. They're committed Christians who know the Bible, who love people, who can listen and give wisdom from God's word. You say, man, I'd love to meet with somebody, you know, once a week for five weeks or once a month for five months who will keep me accountable and pray for me and encourage me. Our lay counselors, am I wrong? They would love to do that, wouldn't they, Dennis? They're waiting to pour into people's lives. You say, man, I could, so what's it cost, like 100 bucks an hour? No, just right now for you, special deal. It's free, okay? You know why it's free? Because you pay the bills around here. It's another reason why we're generous. I think it's $5 for to register or something just to have something. There's like a modest registration. If someone can't afford that, we can waive that. But it's basically free. That, you know, get, get help from a Christian counselor if you need it. Get help from Christian friends, a pastor, a small group that, that talks and prays for you, keeps you accountable. But don't travel alone. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says this. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. There is strength in numbers. Don't travel alone. Don't travel alone. I'm traveling this next 28 days with two brothers who know what they're talking about, who have wisdom, who love me, who will pray for me, and with, I hope, a couple thousand people who are praying for me. And I want to pray for you that whatever it is that God puts in your heart, you can grow in that. Growing the fruit of the self-control. Next thought. Be relentless and committed to press on. Some of you are like, I've tried, and I failed. And that, that, you know, maybe the area that God put on your heart, you're like, I don't want to start up again there. I mean, I've failed 100 times. I've failed 1,000 times. Don't quit. If God put on your heart, that's the area you need self-control, then start again. And can I tell you, don't start tomorrow morning. Start now. You know what I'm saying? Well, Monday morning is a good time to start. I think this afternoon, um, you know what I'm saying, right? Don't, don't start tomorrow. Don't start at 5 o'clock tonight. Now. And, and, and I love these words from Galatians 6, 9. It says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Don't give up. Press into that again. Get support from other people. Lay out, here's the consequences if I don't. Here's the enemy's tactics. Here's the good things if I do. And start down that road again. And, and then know that God gives grace when you stumble. Growing the fruit of self-control. Receive grace when you fall and struggle. Just, just God, I, I want to receive your grace. I've fallen in this area before. I'm afraid to start up again. What if I start again and I fail? God's grace will be enough. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16 says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. This is Jesus. Tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's not give up. Let's not quit. Let's keep pressing forward because God wants more for you than you imagine or dream. When Sherry, uh, when we, Sherry and I met, she was uh, a second grade school teacher and I got to come every so often to her class uh, to Mrs. Leem's class before we were married and play guitar uh, for the kids. And I remember one song that she taught the kids and I wrote these, this opening line. I think it's just a great, it's a great line with great theology. Here's the line of the song. He loves you just the way you are today, but much too much to let you stay that way. Isn't that a great little song? 
not going to sing it for you, but I'll read it again. <laughs> he loves you just the way you are today, but much too much to let you stay that way. Lord Jesus, none of us signed up for this battle. None of us enlisted for this war, but it rages in our souls, and, and your spirit in us gives us power to walk in victory. And when we fall short, your grace is always enough and we can draw near your throne of grace with confidence, knowing that Jesus, this is why you gave your life. You're the God of the next chance and the next chance, but we wanna be transformed. So we pray that we will let your spirit put on our hearts one area that we need to grow in self-control, that we will seek your face and get accountability and walk through the very process we've talked about today. And our prayer is that we will become different people. And Lord, when you've dealt with that area and we've got handles on that and it's under your lordship, then show us the next area because we want to become more and more like Jesus with every passing day. And if you agree with that prayer, say amen. 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 amen.